The next item of business is a debate on motion 12342 in the name of Graeme Simpson on housing. May I ask those who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Graeme Simpson to speak to and move the motion for up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It would have been easy today uh, to put down a motion on housing attacking sluggish house building under the SNP, a sector that's flatlining and an obsession with ill-defined affordable housing, whatever that means, would indeed be worthy of this Parliament's time. But there are other issues in housing that also deserve our attention. I want to concentrate today on our current housing stock. Presiding officer, by 2050, 80% of our current homes will still be in use. In Scotland, a quarter of all domestic dwellings are tenements, and 38% of those are pre-1919. According to the Scottish House Condition Survey of 2016, 6% of all properties need extensive repairs, 28% require urgent repairs, and 48% have disrepair to critical elements. 5% of pre-1919 properties have critical, urgent, and extensive disrepair. Now, members across this chamber have realized that we need to act. A number of us got together and formed a working group. That's different, presiding officer, from a cross-party group. It's a group with work to do. In January, Ben McPherson led a members' debate on this issue. It was consensual, but of course there was no vote. And that's why today we wanted to give Parliament the chance to say that it thinks something should be done. When we talk about tenements, we're talking about buildings in common ownership. It could be any block of flats of any age or one of those foreigner block buildings. And because the ownership and the responsibility for them is shared, that's where problems arise. If you live on the ground floor of a four-story block and the roof needs work, you're not going to be happy to pay, even though it's your roof too. Very often, basic maintenance is not carried out, gutters aren't cleaned, checks are not done, so problems mount, and so do the bills. Now, councils have powers to ensure buildings are kept up to scratch, but with one or two exceptions, are not using them. We're standing at the uh, condition cliff edge, and something has to change, and we think it's inevitable that there will have to be legislative changes. So it is good to see the Scottish Government agrees there should be uh, a review in their amendment. Indeed, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations say the issue is one of real concern and that there is no clear legal requirement for tenement flat owners to fund the maintenance and report of common parts. There have been some good ideas. Ricks mooted the idea of having regular health checks on buildings, and we agree with them. The government amendment backs looking at that too. We also think that factors will have to play a part, but this is where we come to the second part of the motion, which is left untouched by the government amendment, and we are backing that amendment. If we're to have mandatory factoring, then we must have a system that ensures that factors perform well and are struck off if they don't. <coughs> The Property Factors Act of 2011 provides for the performance of factors to be regulated and to comply with a code of conduct. If factors don't measure up, residents can appeal to the Housing and Property Chamber. Since 2013, the Tribunal has issued 169 enforcement orders against factoring companies. One in five of those orders has never been complied with. Last week, Kevin Stewart told this Parliament that just two property factors have been removed from the register since 2013 as a result of having failed to comply with the code and with enforcement orders. Five factors have been removed for technical reasons. There are a number of factoring firms who are repeat offenders. They've had multiple complaints against them and multiple rulings against them. Apex property factor, 13 hearings, 10 rulings against. Charles White Limited, 23 hearings, 19 rulings against. James Gibb, property management, 17 hearings, 13 rulings against. They're just examples. There is no system in place to flag up repeat offenders. Firms just have to comply with an order and can then carry on as before. 
That must be wrong, if you're very quick. John Mason. Yes, I agree with his point that we need to have uh, factors behaving properly. Would you agree that it's useful to have a factor or some kind of organisation looking after a close, because if it's just left to the owners, it's even less likely to happen? Graeme Simpson. Yes, I don't disagree with that at all, but we need to make sure they're operating properly. I don't want to give the impression this is an industry of rogues, presiding officer, because it isn't. The number of tribunal cases is small in relation to the size of the client base, and most factors do not get rulings against them when they appear. But the Property Managers Association of Scotland told me the industry generally would benefit from robust action against any firms consistently failing to meet required standards. I'm glad the government agrees with us on this. Now, Apex came to my attention when I was asked to help one of their clients. Sophie Wells is an owner-occupier in a block of flats in Motherwell. She came to me earlier this year in desperation, so I went to see her and my blood boiled. In 2014, lead flashing was stolen from the building. This has never been replaced. Water leaks into the building and the wood is rotting. Parts of the ceiling are missing. Walls are damp and mouldy. They're green and it's not the colour of the paint. Doors have been kicked in by drug addicts. Windows are broken, downpipes are missing, repairs haven't been carried out. In December 2016, the communal areas were without lighting. Residents asked for help from Apex. The lighting wasn't fixed, so Sophie and a neighbour rigged up their own. General complaints relate to invoicing for cleaning and maintenance works that have not been done. Sophie's cleaned the block herself, cut the grass, picked up litter and redecorated inside and out. The main door to the block has also been replaced by Sophie and a neighbour. The intercom system is vandalised and doesn't work. I recently met with officials from North Lanarkshire Council. They're not prepared to use the powers they have to get anything done to help the residents. They should be ashamed of themselves. As I said earlier, Apex is one of a number of firms with multiple rulings against them. Uh, let me just tell you about one of the cases heard by the tribunal involving a property in Renfrew. It involved an invoice for repair works. The property owner asked to see the three competitive quotes the factor had received. Three quotes were provided. Quote one, real building contractors, no company address or VAT number. Quote two, concept builders, quote dated after the request for three competitive quotes. The applicant tried to call the telephone number on the quote, but it was not in use. The website listed did not exist. The postal address was a mail drop, drop box company, and the applicant found a company with the same name, but they denied having provided the quote. Quote three, quality property maintenance. No date, no VAT, no address. The landline telephone number turned out to be a branch of a shoe shop at Parkhead Forge. The case goes on to establish various breaches of the code. I've got some suggestions. We should introduce a rating system for factor companies. There should be a flagging system. There should be better consumer support. And it should be possible for applicants to mention things to the tribunal that they've forgotten to put in their complaint form. We need to look after what we have, and we need the system to do it. I move the motion in my name. I now call Kevin Stewart to speak to and move Amendment 12342.3 for up to six minutes, please, Minister. Uh, thank you, President Officer, and I'm pleased to have the opportunity to speak this afternoon uh, and welcome this debate that Graham Simpson has brought forward on the important issue of tenement property maintenance. Uh, looking at the amendments from across this chamber, it is clear that we have a lot to agree on. Had Alex Cole Hamilton's amendment been selected, uh, we would certainly have supported it and very much agree that improving the quality of housing stock uh, will support our uh, efforts to eradicate fuel poverty and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Through Energy Efficient Scotland, we will encourage and support owners to improve their homes. Likewise, um, I entirely agree with Andy Whiteman's unselected amendment that VAT should be removed for building repairs and improvements. Scottish ministers have spoken on this on numerous occasions and have pressed the UK government directly. And I'd encourage all parties to join us in calling on the UK government to make this very sensible change. 
Uh, Pauline McNeill's amendment rightly highlights the various ways open to owners to manage and improve their properties, for example, cooperative arrangements. I encourage owners to work together to put in place the most appropriate mechanism for them. And the Under One Roof website is a useful source of impartial advice and information for owners, and we will continue to support it as a government. Uh, I welcome Ben McPherson's establishment of a working group of MSPs from across this chamber and, of course, interested stakeholders too, to look at ways for owners to better look after tenements. Uh, I look forward to hearing this group's findings and particularly about the practical difficulties to enforcement and costs that may be involved for homeowners. I will... If you just give me two seconds, I will. I will, of course, give serious consideration to proposals that come out of the group. And I'll Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful to the Minister for taking my intervention. Should the proposals coming forth from that cross-party working group include a need for primary legislation, will the government commit to bringing such legislation forward? Kevin Stewart. Yes, um, we're absolutely committed to keeping our policy frameworks and legislation under review. Uh, to ensure that everyone lives in a good quality home. Um, in terms of some of the powers that are already existing and, and future regulations, actions has been taken already to improve property condition. The 2014 Housing Act allows local authorities to pay and then subsequently recover missing shares of owners who do not contribute to their share of common works. And I know that this is a subject that we have touched upon previously uh, in the debate that uh, Ben McPherson brought forward. And I, again, would say to all local authorities, you have this power, use it to help your citizens. Uh, a number of local authorities have already used these powers. Um, the others must follow. And there must be the sharing of best practice. I, I, I will indeed give way. Daniel Johnson. This is really just a point of clarification. Could you maybe clarify, sorry, could the Minister maybe clarify which local authorities and how many have used and have not used uh, the, the, the legislation that he mentioned? Uh, Kevin off, Stewart. Off of the top of my head, I don't have that answer for Mr Johnson, presiding officer, uh, but I'm more than willing to provide him with that information. I know that Glasgow is using missing share very well. Um, Aberdeen has recently used it for the first time, and I hope uh, that Aberdeen will do uh, much, much more in that regard. And I've also committed to extend these missing share powers to registered social landlords, uh, and regulations on this will be introduced later on this year. Uh, for owners, uh, we're pilot piloting our £10 million equity loan scheme in Glasgow, Argyll and Butte, and Perth and King and Ross to fund essential repairs and energy efficiency improvements, including common works. And local authorities should use all the powers at their disposal to tackle poor quality housing in the private rented sector, including through enhanced enforcement areas and the power to report breaches of the repairing standard directly to the first tier tribunal on behalf of tenants. Uh, we've already consulted on improving condition standards in the private rented sector uh, with draft regulations proposed for later this year. And I intend to consult on other condition issues, including specific matters affecting tenement properties again later this year. Turning to property factors, uh, through Patricia Ferguson's Property Factors Scotland Act 2011 Members Bill, which received cross-party support, Scotland led the way in having a, spe a specific statutory framework to protect homeowners who use the services of property factors. The regulatory regime has been enforced for over five years, uh, and we are considering how this could be strengthened and consulted recently on revised code of conduct for property factors and whether the Act has improved the wider regulatory regime. Uh, we will shortly publish an analysis of the consultation responses, and we will use this to shape future standards of practice. Presiding officer, I believe that there is a clear consensus across this chamber and that we can all agree that there's no single quick fix to improve the conditions of Scotland's homes. But I very much welcome this debate and the creation of the cross-party supported working group on maintenance of tenement scheme property. And I commit to continue working with the sector to review and strengthen policy and legislation so that everyone across Scotland lives in a good quality home. Thank you very much.
Uh, Pauline McNeill, up to five minutes, please. President Officer, I welcome this debate in the name of Graham Simpson. Tenement properties is a complex subject and one which this Parliament has made significant progress on. But it is also an area of law crying out for more action, for more investment and for more solutions. We are broadly supportive of everything on the table tonight in terms of the motions and amendments, but I'll briefly explain our amendment and what it seeks to do. So we felt that the Tory motion was reflective of our position, but that it appeared to read that mandatory building health checks would be, would be mandatory. And we felt that our amendment clarifies that it would be up for consideration rather than mandatory. And in order to do that, we had to insert the rest of the amendment to put the bit in at the end about the cooperatives as an alternative to factoring. We will support the Green position as well. We would have supported the Liberal Democrat motion had it been selected for debate. And if our motion falls, we will vote for the government position. Uh, and that's essentially because we feel that there is a lot of commonality between us. We think the government needs to be a bit stronger in giving some commitment to legislation this parliament to determine that really only is the division um, between us. The law and management of tenement property is much wider than uh, traditional tenements, as has been said already by Graham Simpson's uh, tenements built in the 19th century, where we saw an explosion of these types um, of buildings uh, are much, much, much wider. Um, any flatted property, whether there are common repairs and maintenance issues, are the types of properties we're talking about. The tenement is a fantastic but complex building forum. Uh, I'm not alone in saying that I've owned three myself in the West End of Glasgow. Dry rot, poor factoring, leaky roofs, uncooperative neighbours all go with the territory. In uh, many cases at my surgery too, where people trying to get factors in place, properties not registered and rented out and owners left with the debt of others which they have not paid. So we welcome the work of the cross-party group in the maintenance of tenement properties. Uh, we believe strongly that it will be needed to come up with some real solutions in this parliamentary session. Existing provisions are inadequate, in our view, for dealing with the extent of Scotland's tenement housing. And in particular, we welcome the discussion on owners' associations, which currently have no legal status, but it is worth exploring what else they can do if they had the teeth to do it. Housing associations are already playing a vital role in preserving and improving tenements that were in serious disrepair. But some social landlords are selectively selling flats where they are the minority owner as they struggle to meet the housing quality standard. A rapid rise in the number of private landlords, growth in property values which lead to owners becoming property rich but income poor is a key problem in this area. Owners failing to address maintenance and passing it on to the next owner is a huge problem and I hope one that is not missed by members. And it would be unfair, I think, of us to think of schemes that would effectively penalise the current owner when the maintenance and repairs have built up over a much longer period of time, so we need to think about that too. The reluctance of owners to take a long-term view and interest in their property is a critical point in this debate. The West of Scotland Housing Association estimates that 12,500 substandard properties pre-1914 and 5,000 post-1924 properties are just amongst their members in themselves. Crumbling stonework, a lack of maintenance, roofs and gutters as to some of the problems. Glasgow City Council estimated that in 2015 that 7,000 tenements were below tolerable standards. And Renfrew Council is estimated in the same year that it has 1,200 that are below tolerable standard. And they cite as the main problem a lack of routine maintenance and a lack of interest from owners generally. They say it's difficult to engage landlords in any discussion about the management and maintenance and the common fabric of the building. And West of Scotland Housing Association also say that former right to buy properties are now a major time bomb. In fact, in my own experience, and I'm sure in others, and many owners did not seem to fully understand that with ownership comes the responsibility of the property and the common part of the steer, the close and the solemn. So we need some solutions. We need solutions that help ordinary tenants trying to take common decisions, um, everyday decisions and common repairs and ensure that the law favours them over absentee landlords who cannot be found and not taking an interest in their properties. We need to support landlords trying to invest in their properties we need long-term thinking that does not penalise only current owners. We need to support housing associations too in the work that they are doing. I believe in this parliament we will need some legislation, but I think if we work together with a group that's already set up and working effectively, 
I think there will be some common ground between us. I believe we can do some good here for the owners of tenement properties and make the law stronger in their favour. Thank you very much. It was, it was my omission to say that Polly McNeill was speaking to Amendment 12342. May I ask her to move it, please? I move, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And we move to Andy Whiteman for up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer, and thanks to Graeme Simpson for using Conservative business to bring forward a motion on a topic that is designed to achieve, I hope, broad agreement across the Chamber. Um, and as he mentioned, this followed Ben McPherson's members' debate earlier this year, and I'm delighted we've subsequently established a cross-party working group on maintenance of tenement scheme property. Graham Simpson posited that as, in contrast, a cross-party group that doesn't do any work. Uh, a lot of cross-party groups do a lot of work, but I'm sure he didn't mean to uh, imply that. Um, Scottish Greens have a manifesto commitment to establish a not-for-profit repair service to manage major repairs, together with commitments to look at logbooks, sinking funds and mandatory energy efficiency measures at point of sale in the private sector. And we also pre promised to press for the removal of VAT on building repairs. And I welcome the Minister's comments in that regard. Uh, given that more people are likely to live in flatted property than any other type of domestic property, and with 68% of dwellings in Edinburgh, uh, in particular being flat flatted, it's incumbent on us to deal with this highly unsatisfactory state of repairs that confronts far too many people on a daily basis. Uh, basis. Getting things right for tenement dwellers is not just about ensuring maintenance, it's also about promoting their health. Uh, having personally experienced threats of physical violence and harassment in the past when trying to initiate tenement repairs, I can well understand, uh, and through meeting constituents, understand the stress and anxiety that comes from poor governance in uh, tenements. Uh, the private sector has made some useful interventions, such as the tenement health check policy, but there are still huge legal and financial barriers standing in the way of maintaining tenements to a acceptable standard. Presiding officer, how long do I have? Four minutes. Four minutes, thank you. Uh, much of the flatted property in Edinburgh and Glasgow, Aberdeen as well, Dundee, was built more than a century ago. Uh, and with proper refurbishment and maintenance, they, these buildings should last many more centuries. And in that sense, Tenements, in my view, are part of the public infrastructure of our cities, just as the streets, the sewers and the utilities uh, are. But within this public infrastructure, these at the moment are framed in law as private interests. And it's the essentially short-term interests, typically 10 years, perhaps 15 years, that too often prevails and frustrates the necessity to undertake regular maintenance that could ensure the long-term good condition of shared property. So I'd be keen to that we frame this debate as one concerning public infrastructure rather than strictly private property. Now, the law is further complicated, as Dr. Frankie McCarthy from the School of Law at Glasgow University helpfully outlined at a recent meeting of the cross-party group on renewable energy, uh, where she observed that in law there is no such thing as a building, but a set of individual flats plus some common parts. So we have a fragmentation of ownership. The rules of ownership are not standard. The default rules are set out in the Tenement Scotland Act 2004, but the title deeds may well say something different. Strategic areas of the tenement are not always owned by the same people, the walls, the roof, and the foundations. There's no management at all built into the tenure system. In principle, all owners are responsible, but in practice, uh, there's nothing in Scotland's system of land tenure relating to owners' associations, no obligation to meet, no maintenance plans, no sinking funds, and management generally is reactive at best. And whilst repairs and maintenance can be done with a majority vote, improvements require unanimity. Now, I think we used to do things a little bit better. In the members' debate uh, that I spoke of, uh, I mentioned visiting Edinburgh City Chambers and finding a small dark room full of cabinets uh, with index cards, all noting inspections that the council had, had, had made to tenement property across the city up until around the early 1980s. So we used to have systems in place. We need to review the legislation to ensure that they come back. I'm pleased to see the motion and the amendments all largely say the same thing, and we're supporting them all this evening. I call Alex Cole Hamilton. Up to four minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It's always very hard to follow Andy Whiteman in a speech such as this. I'm very much one of those MSPs who learn at the knee of the maestro in this regard. And I, I like to put on record my thanks, <laughs> my thanks, not just for this debate, 
but um, for, for the additional assistance he's given me in, in land and ownership matters as well. Uh, Thank you to the contribution of the consensus. Would everyone Thanks be well. quiet, please? I think I Mr. Whiteman grateful. would like to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come on. Despite, um, despite that outburst, I am very grateful to the Conservatives for bringing today's motion before us. It, I think it's a, a very important one. I'm also gratified to hear that they will be accepting the government amendment because I think it would be wrong to preempt the outcome of that expert working group into this critical area. I think if, um, if I can reflect on the fact that the shadow of Grenfell falls far and wide across our housing policy landscape. If ever there was an event to concentrate minds around building integrity, around property repair and upgrade and the needs for building safety checks, it is to be found in the ashes of that fire. And I was very proud yesterday to sign the private member's bill in the name of David Stewart uh, to see fire protection systems installed in properties of a certain size. I was also gratified by the responsibility shown by the industry, the property factor industry, in the aftermath of that event, and that the Property Managers Association of Scotland rushed to assist the Scottish Government in its efforts to ascertain just how many additional buildings were exposed. Uh, property management is an important structure within the theatre of our housing uh, delivery in this country. By and large, factors act responsibly and offer solutions to everyday problems like communal living, uh, whether that's stair lighting, security, clear, uh, cleaning, insurance provision. But they also have a role in that sort of early footholds or fo foothills rather of our democracy by establishing residence associations, helping uh, residents to come together and work together um, to, to make their communities better and, and address common problems. There are some rogue elements, as within any sector, there are rogue elements in that trade too. And there have been several concerns expressed already in this debate about the way that uh, factors respond to concerns of, uh, of residents, about the collection of unpaid fees from paying customers and how incremental charge increases and exorbitant one-off management fees can often be the subject of our post bags in terms of constituency casework. I have a great deal of support uh, for Labour's amendment in particular around the idea of cooperatives being used to step in as an alternative for factoring in this regard. Now, the thrust of my amendment, had it been taken, was twofold. Firstly, about the sustainability of the property and the improvements to the properties that we are making, but also a recognition, as Graham Simpson uh, articulated very well in his opening remarks, about that backlog of repairs that we have in our housing stock, and that 28% of which require critical, abjectly critical repairs that are not being seen to. And the point is that that runs to billions of pounds, and somebody has to pay for that. And invariably, up to this point, that somebody has been people being slapped with a statutory charge notice. It's not um, something that anybody expected or, or would have wanted, but the introduction, as I think Andy Whiteman referenced as well, the maestro, um, in the sink funds that he talks about, those owner-contributed um, repair funds, which can soften the blow that will inevitably come in that aspect of communal living and particularly aging stock. Now, this is very much an important debate, and I'm very glad, actually, of the consensus that I didn't necessarily expect to come into this afternoon. I think it's a measure of just how important this parliament regards it, and that we need to get this right. We need to listen to the recommendations of the cross-party working group when they are published, and I'm very gratified that the minister confirmed that he would be, uh, his government would be willing to bring forward legislation should that be required. Thank you. Thank you very much. We now go to the open part of the debate. I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Ben McPherson. I'm afraid it's quite a tight four minutes this afternoon. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And again, can I thank um, the contributions so far? Um, I should remind members that uh, for uh, 12 years I was an Edinburgh councillor, and for most of that period, or for all of that period, I chaired the Governance Risk and Best Value Committee in the Council and spent many, many hours listening to evidence about what went wrong here in Edinburgh in regard to our tenement repair scandal. And I think there are lessons that we need to learn from that, not just here in Edinburgh, but across Scotland. Edinburgh, like other cities, do have many tenements. Many of them are aging, many of them require maintenance, and many of them require safety, not just for the owners, but actually for those who are walking on the pavements. When often things go wrong, it affects the wider community. As Graeme Shenson mentioned in his speech, Ricks has mooted the idea 
of having regular health checks on buildings, and we do welcome that. But I think there becomes the challenge, because um, Andy Whiteman was right, uh, up until the mid-1980s here in Edinburgh, every tenement building was checked on a regular basis, and detailed records were kept. But the issue then comes, what happens if the tenement is not being maintained correctly? Because we can have all the good wishes and all the aspirations of wanting tenements kept in the right order. But unless there are the correct sanctions and enforcement behind that, and unless local authorities are then willing to do that, we are simply going to end up in a situation with lots of notices put on buildings, but no enforcement and no action taken. And in places, again, like Edinburgh, where you have um, a lot of landlords who do not live here, it is not an easy way to enforce. Um, there are many people, particularly two in front of me, uh, who are much better, I'm sure, on tenement law than I am. But it is a complex area. And again, I think it is something we need to look at if we're going to move forward with any new legislation, because the law, at best, is unclear. That takes me briefly on, presiding officer, to my second point, because factoring can help. Uh, my first uh, flat that I bought here in Edinburgh uh, was a modern flat, and a factor was almost imposed upon us. Now, it did actually work well. Um, the flat was well looked after. It was clean and tidy, at least outside, if not inside. <laughs> but uh, it was expensive. There was no choice as to who we could choose to be our factor. It was simply imposed upon us through the title deeds. And again, particularly here in Edinburgh, that has not been the tradition. And there are many flats in Edinburgh which have no tenements. And I'm sure all of us who are Lothian or Edinburgh MSPs will have had mailbags of maybe one individual, uh, an older person, trying to get the flat or the stairway cleaned and just simply not being able to do it because, the, because other people won't do it. And again, I think factoring is the way forward. But, and I come back to that but again, there must be the right sanctions and enforcement behind that so that there is power. And I would also suggest there must also be the choice on who you have as your factor and how that works for the individual flat owners rather than somebody else imposing upon it. I too welcome uh, this debate, I welcome this consensus that is um, occurring around the chamber. But I think before we pat ourselves too much on the back, uh, I think it is easy to analyse the difficulties coming up with the solutions may take a lot harder work. Thank you. Thank you. I call Ben McPherson to be followed by Daniel Johnson. Ben McPherson. Thank you very much, President Officer, and I absolutely also very, very much welcome uh, the, the use of this time for this important debate, building on the momentum of the 2004 Act that was brought previously, the 2014 Act, and my members' debate in January, and the establishment of our working group thereafter, and what, what we're doing. I think it's always good to, to start with a definition, and I know others have, have talked about how inclusive the idea of a tenement is, but I think if we look at the definition in the 2004 Act, which is a building or a part of a building which comprises two related flats that are designed to be separate in ownership and divided from each other horizontally, so a block of four or bigger. And I think it's just important to emphasize that because it's not just relevant to the tenement that I live in and my constituents, many, many of my constituents live in that sort of larger tenement. It's also relevant to different parts of Scotland and, and, and that includes rural parts of Scotland as well. So this is a, a big issue. It's about a quarter of, how, of Scotland's domestic housing stock, about half a million homes. So this is a huge, matter for us all to consider. And it's crucial because it really matters. It really matters to people's quality of life, whether their communal stair is in good condition or not, or there's a secure lock on the door. It really matters if the roof is in good condition, not just for the integrity of the building, but for the life in which all owners or tenants are living within that property. As has been said, uh, and very well said by the last speaker, this is a very complex area of law and policy with local government, national government, 
private law in terms of deeds and uh, rights as well. So we need to think very carefully about how we proceed in this. Uh, the current powers are helping. Things like under one roof and the missing share are making a difference. But there is more work to do because of the issues that we all receive in terms of the casework that we have and also the wider points that are made by stakeholders. So the group that I've been working with other MSPs and, and experts and stakeholders on is looking at how we come forward with new solutions, not just to repair and maintain, but also to enhance. And that's why energy efficiency and matters like that that have been raised are so important. And we're looking at this in three main ways. We need to think about, first of all, who initiates works? Who organizes? And how do we get people to pay for it? And one of the questions around that is, yes, factors are one way of, of doing that. But are there other mechanisms that we need to think about to facilitate owners' decision-making and the instruction of maintenance work? Do we need a new standard entity for owners to organize within, helping owners to connect and communicate with each other and also create that leadership and organization, a, a structure for collective decision-making? So that's one area that we're looking at. The other area that's been touched on is around inspections, potentially regular inspections, to get away from repairs and towards maintenance, so there's less need for repair. And there are possibilities about whether this should be uh, part of the home report uh, as properties are, are passed on. And the other area then is finance, which is around sinking funds, credit unions, and I welcome the suggestion of cooperatives in that discussion as well. So we need to think about a set of arrangements for the long term and think through this issue thoroughly, as has already been said, to make sure that we come up with really well thought through solutions that are going to last and make a difference in the medium and long term. There's a lot more I could say, but I'll conclude by saying this. It's great to see the Parliament coming together to play its part to try and help our constituents come together and maintain the urban and rural integrity of Scotland now and going forward. Thank you. Thank you. I call Daniel Johnson to be followed by Gordon Linters. Daniel Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. It's a uh, huge pleasure that I stand to speak in this debate, speaking after uh, Graham Simpson, Ben McPherson, Andy Whiteman, and I'm sure others from the working group will be speaking too. Indeed, I think we may be forming something of the world's geekiest uh, boy band. And while we not, might not be pretty to look at, I think we are all singing in harmony on this issue. Sorry for the bad joke. But this is a hugely important issue. And I think Graham Simpson was absolutely right in two regards as he opened this debate, both in terms of setting this in the context of the wider housing issues, but also just the scale of the maintenance repair that has to take place. But because I think all too often the housing debate is one that's dominated by definitions uh, and one which sees people splitting hair between one form of housing or another, uh, citing telephone numbers without any regard to levels of demand or the need, level of housing need. Because we on this side of the chamber, as a, a point of historic principle, view housing as a right. It's part of Labour's legacy and history, and one that I think is an important part of our future politics. Because I think we have to accept that we, the market-based thinking around housing, viewing it simply as a commodity, has failed. Because we have a situation where, while incomes have been largely flat, rents, especially in Edinburgh and Glasgow, has risen by almost a third in the last decade, while mortgage-owned property has fallen by a quarter in the same period. We've got a situation where rent is outstripping incomes and housing poverty is a very real issue. The very opportunities and expectations people might have had merely a decade ago are simply becoming dreams for all too many. So if we view housing as a right, I think we must also I think, accept Andy Whiteman's uh, language about viewing housing as infrastructure, public infrastructure. That is a property that is a sense of common ownership as well as private ownership. And we all must also recognize the issue of mixed tenure and occupancy. Because in, in the last uh, uh, few decades, the reality is, is we've got a, a, a picture where it's not just about tenement living in the traditional sense, but we have a, a wide variety of different properties. But critically, within those properties, multiple forms of ownership and tenure. 
We may, may well have council tenants, but owner occupiers, and also private rented property. And with the proliferation of small private landlords, the issues around maintenance become hugely problematic. So there's a very real case for change. Um, and indeed, I, I welcome the, the issues that the, the, the working group is going to be looking at. And I think Ben McPherson set it out very well, because there's a sense in which the individualised uh, concept of ownership, that much of our property and the way that people own tenemented properties, just simply doesn't take into account the fact that they are very much owners of a collective building, that there is a sense of common ownership within a single building which just simply isn't captured within the law. And I think this is the fundamental point uh, which needs to be captured and needs to be addressed in, in law. Now, I'd also like to thank the Tenement Action Group, whose work very much has acted as a very positive starting point. And they supplied the working group with a, key, uh, a list of seven key points that they would like to see addressed. And they range from simple things about having the owner contact details for all the owners in the stair available and freely shared, something that, while the identity of owners is publicly available, the means of contacting them is not. But their, their issues range through from those simple prosaic points through to issues around sinking funds and debt recovery. And I think critical to this is making sure that we go from a situation which is more, more than just about uh, enabling owners to uh, get uh, compensation and make uh, arrangements for common repairs uh, on a one-off basis, but ongoing preventative maintenance. That's what we need to see. And I see my time is up. I could go on for much longer. But fundamentally, we do need to see a change in the law. It's far too important. Our housing belongs to us all. We need to make sure that they are properly maintained. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by... Sorry, I call Richard Lyle to be followed by Gordon Lindhurst. Oh. Did I get the wrong way round? OK, I'll call okay, uh, Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Richard Lyle in that case. I'm ready. I'm you know, Richard Lyle's ready. We'll let Richard Lyle speak. <laughs> I didn't quite hear that. Richard's ready. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin this afternoon by welcoming the opportunity to contribute to this debate, which is an issue which I'm very familiar with, especially having served as a councillor, Motherwell District Council, and then subsequently North Lancashire Council for some 36 years. Housing is, of course, a core role for local government, and today's debate will, I hope, provide me with an opportunity to address that which the Conservative benches have raised. From the outset in this debate, President Officer, I wish to raise the fact that there actually has been a marked and sustained improvement in the quality of housing in Scotland. And indeed, this latest Scottish Housing Condition Survey shows a continual long-time trend of improvement in levels of, di of uh, disrepair. It is important to note that problems can affect newer buildings as well as older ones, and they occur, occur right across Scotland. However, there is a recognition that disrepair is worse than older tenement buildings, and this Scottish Government, I believe, recognises that there can be particular difficulties in dealing with common repairs in tenements which require cooperation between owners and can cut across tenures. From my experience in the Council, I know it is hard as a, a fact that trying to fix issues between the Council, uh, properties and private owners or landlords is hard. It takes longer and it is a headache at times. The Right to Buy Act allowed people to own but it created multi-owner problems. Often some owners, particularly those who are elderly, don't have the finance to renovate, and these are the problems we must address. That said, I think it's important to point out to the Chamber that although we in the SNP must, be not, must not be complacent, the improvement levels of disrepair is absolutely a reflection of the positive actions that this Government has already, already taken. From new powers introduced in the Housing Scotland Act in 2014 to our working consultant on improving condition standards in the private rented sector, draft regulations are proposed later this year. Councils can use those powers to pay and recover from owners who do not contribute, and I would encourage them to do so. In thinking about conditions of housing, President Officer, I was reminded of a time as a councillor during when, when I was faced with bison-type flats in my ward, which had the most horrendous dampness and poor conditions. Talk about green. These were very green uh, uh, walls. Through my engagement at the time with the authority, they subsequently demol uh, demolished them and replaced them with new high-quality buildings. And whilst this did earn me that, uh, amongst my many other names, the nickname of Demolition Dick, I am now, uh, it's now paying dividends in Bell Sill. And I'm sure this is a matter which must be considered too when we look at the disrepair, uh, disrepair of some properties. In North Lancashire now we have an excellent capital investment programme 
Sorry, Mr uh, Simpson, I have to agree that North Lanarkshire, and they'll be surprised I'm saying this, that North Lanarkshire is working with us and they are working with private owners. And therefore, uh, I don't believe there's any monopoly of good ideas, and I welcome the commitment from the government that they will look at all possible solutions. Many issues to address these problems have been previously raised, raised in the Scottish Government's Common Housing Quality Standard Forum, including stinking funds and the five yearly tenement surveys. There have also been suggested by RICS, the Built Environment Forum Scotland, Chartered Institute of, Scot of Housing, all of these, and I'm sure the ideas which the Government will listen to. It's clear from today's debate that uh, we all wish to uh, solve this problem and it's thanks to the Scottish Government's support for local authorities and indeed through legislation that progress is being made in this issue. Progress which is very much welcome and rightly be recognised. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Lyle. Thank you for being ready to speak there. Uh, Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by John Mason. Gordon Lindhurst. Mm. Presiding Officer, it is indeed a, um, a delight to be allowed an opportunity to speak in this debate. Um, I'm not sure if I can match Richard Lyle's speech, and I certainly can't match some of the nicknames that he says are attributed <laughs> to him. <laughs> now, now... <laughs> Turning to this important and welcome debate, there are, of course, few issues more important than our housing stock. Indeed, we, uh, the Scottish Conservatives, consistently ask for the Scottish Government to be more ambitious in house building. But of course, that will be in vain if our current stock is left to crumble around us. Homes are places where we spend huge amounts of our time, private time with family and friends in warmth and comfort, if the conditions are right. But if they are not, it can have far-reaching and negative consequences, including on health. The tenement buildings of the old and new towns play an important part in Edinburgh as a world heritage site. 48% of housing built pre-1945 in Edinburgh and 56% of that is flats. Across Scotland as a whole, it is said that 68% of all dwellings are in some degree of disrepair. Now, I've been fortunate to have experienced living in a tenement in Edinburgh but also unfortunate, like others, in trying to have necessary common repairs carried out. Um, unlike the Alex Cole Hamilton described maestro Andy Whiteman, I have more generally met complete and utter disinterest rather than threats of violence or harassment. And I think it is easy to see why, given that sort of background, how easily tenements can start to decay if only some people are prepared to stump up their fair share. As recognized by many organizations, including the RICS, cosmetic changes can seem far more attractive to a homeowner who can experience the almost immediate, depending on the workman, <laughs> and tangible benefits of showering in a new bathroom or making dinner in a newly fitted kitchen. But if a block isn't maintained, the risk of being condemned as unfit to live in later down the line is greater. Now, this was described by Dr. James Simpson, who initiated the Tenement Action Group as the Plateau of Good Repair, which describes how failure to maintain a building regularly can be hugely inefficient. Helping people to see this is all well and good, but today the Scottish Conservatives are encouraging the Scottish Government to think about what can actually be done to deal with Scotland's tenement housing stock. Even mandatory building health checks will only be as effective as they are accurate and as they are easily enforceable, as Ben McPherson pointed to. Public buy-in and acceptance of these is also essential, and they must be affordable. A box-ticking exercise simply will not do, and I think, for example, of problems with EPCs. So a culture of factoring, including a mandatory system for new build flats, could mean that owners can maintain buildings from the very beginning and keep their place on the sunny plateau already <coughs> mentioned. As we've heard today, some factors do a superb job, but others leave an awful lot to be desired. Graham Simpson pointed to this. 70% of complaints upheld last year against factors is deeply concerning. It tells us the current system is not working in the interests of homeowners as it ought to be. Factoring needs to be transparent and accountable, 
with bad factors identified and dealt with. The future of our housing stock is not simply determined by how many houses we build now, but how we maintain what we have. In closing, it is imperative that the government reviews the current system and takes effective steps to protect our housing stock now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me call John Mason. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, as others have said, there's a lot in the Conservative motion that uh, I can certainly agree with, and not least the basic statement of the fact that we do have a problem with common repairs to tenement properties. If I'm going to declare an interest today, it is that I am an owner-occupier in the state of about 270 privately owned ex-council tenements. I paid about £25,000 for my flat in 1990 and is probably now worth between two and three times that. However, during these 28 years, there has been no substantial maintenance work done and as far as I'm aware, not even a thorough inspection. We have a factor in place and I have no complaint about them. They arrange common buildings insurance and grounds maintenance as well as charging what I think is a fairly modest administration fee. However, even then, some owners have substantial arrears, and the factor has said that they have more problems with owner-occupiers than they do with landlords who let out their property. There can also be a lack of understanding that the admin fee is not actually going into maintenance work or some sinking fund. The problem in our estate is an unwillingness or inability of owners to pay for regular checks and maintenance. So basically this estate, which won an award for Bellway's refurbishment, has been deteriorating for the last 29 years and looks like it will keep deteriorating for the next 29 years. Just on Monday, another resident in the estate, obviously a constituent, phoned me to see if we could arrange a public meeting, maybe change the factors or take some other action to move things forward. I explained to him that previously we did do that, we did have a very large public meeting, but we could not find six residents to form a, a residence committee. But anyway, I will meet him next week and go over things again. So given that there is a problem, what are we going to do about it? I guess some of us could say that it's a private matter and Parliament should, should stay clear of it. And there are some good things that are going on, but often they are on a very small scale at the moment. Some of the housing associations in my constituency are working with Glasgow City Council to purchase a few of the worst flats in the hope of improving the whole close. But inevit inevitably, this is a small scale. Speaking to property managers, housing associations, RICs and others, it does seem there is widespread feeling that things need to change, which is why Ben McPherson has led on setting up a working group and a number of us at Backbenchers are keen to look at the options. I think I have two main questions at the moment. One, what is the model we are aiming to get to? Can it be a voluntary scheme of, voluntary, of regular inspections which would make owners and potential purchasers aware of the problems with their properties and hopefully encourage them to take action? Or does there need to be an element of compulsion, possibly including a requirement for factors or at least a more formal self-factoring such as I think Labour propose with the cooperative arrangements? And my second question is how and how quickly can we move to such a desired model, especially if we agree, agree that there's some need or for le some level of compulsion, how do we cope with the many owner occupiers who just don't, do not have the savings to pay a hefty maintenance bill and who do not have the income to borrow commercially? I think we would need to look at some innovative methods, for example, interest-free loans, which would only be repayable when a flat was sold or transferred, as I think the SFHA mentioned in their briefing. With any of these options, there are likely to be costs to homeowners, and that has the potential to be politically challenging. If one party went into an election proposing this, I fear that it could cause them problems. So I think this is an issue that would benefit hugely from cross-party agreement, and I hope the working group together with the government can look through the various alternatives and come up with something that would have broad consensus, both in the model we're aiming for and in the timescale for implementing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we now move to closing speeches. I call Alec Rowley to be followed by the Minister, Kevin Stewart. Alec Rowley. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, John Mason talked about the need for cross-party 
um, cooperation and agreement. And I think today we have seen that there is cross-party agreement that something needs to be done here. And I certainly would welcome, as others have done, the fact that, that the Conservatives have used their time to have this discussion today on what is a very important issue. Ben McPherson and Daniel Johnson both spoke about the definitions and the definition that I had from SPICE is that the tenement is broadly in legislation to include, for example, modern blocks of flats, so-called four and a block properties and buildings which have been subdivided into flats. So there is, there is a lot there. Um, interestingly, a few weeks ago, I had, I had um, a contact with a councillor in Dunfermline, as Graham Simpson gave the example of his constituent, Sophie, I think that's an experience that many people that live in flats and four and a block and, and what would be the traditional tenement experience. Um, and that councillor said to me that the situation uh, in Took and Golf Drum, Drum Street in Dunfermline uh, was a real problem where there are owner occupiers and council tenants in the same block and Fife Council are unable to get the work done due to, to this issue with people not having funds. Um, now, I do have the definition uh, and more detail from SPICE, which I have sent to the head of housing in Fife Council, asking him to look at this and advise where there is weaknesses in the, the, the law so that we can look at that. Because John Mason also asked the question about uh, what is it that we're trying to do here and how quickly. And I think we do need to ask those questions of the minister. The minister said that councils do have powers and they do have powers to step in and pay missing shares where uh, an owner cannot be found or where the owner is unwilling to pay. Um, but there may be financial restraints on them doing so. And I would, I would ask the, the Minister, perhaps one of the things, given that there is cross-party agreement in here, that this is an issue that needs to be tackled fairly quickly, then could we not get the housing conveners of the different councils round the table with COSLA to actually start to have a discussion around this to say what are the issues as far as the local authorities are concerned because some use the mission shares uh, root law and some don't. Let's find out what that's about and what else, because I'm sure there is also a consensus right across local councils that we need to do something on this issue. Graeme Simpson. I'd just like to uh, extend an invitation to Alex Rowley to come to the next meeting of the working group uh, when I shall uh, reveal what every Scottish council told me in answer to his questions. Alex Rowley. But, I mean, I certainly would be pleased to do so, and I'm certain our, our, our House and Spokesperson, Polly McNeill, will, will also uh, want to, to hear what, what Graham Simpson has to say, because as Polly McNeill said, there is issues around, do we need more powers? Do we need more investment? Uh, and that also to be clear that with ownership comes responsibility when you live in these types of tenements that are being raised. And that was an important point that, that was made by Andy Whiteman when, when he talked about the promotion of health and the stress and anxiety that can be caused for tenants. And we need to take that on board. But I think he also made a very important point, which I will conclude on, which is that these tenements and much of this, if the investment goes in, they will last for centuries. If that investment does not go in, then we will need to be building more houses, never mind the 50,000 affordable houses that the government plans just now to replace those run-down tenements. So it's in the public interest that we resolve this matter. There is consensus in this chamber to do so. I would urge the Minister to work with everyone to try and find a solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call the Minister, Kevin Stewart. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Um, I am again pleased to uh, close uh, uh, on this uh, debate. Uh, uh, I welcome Mr Simpson's motion. I have to say I'm a bit surprised to hear discussion today of parliamentary boy bands uh, and the exploits of Demolition Dick, but you never know what you're going to get when you come in this chamber. Um, but if, if I could first of all turn to, to some of the issues that have been raised, and I'm going to concentrate on the issues um, uh, that have been discussed here today. Um, Mr. Rowley has made a very good point uh, around about talking to housing conveners, and I can assure Mr. Rowley that I will ensure that that's on the agenda 
for my next meeting uh, with uh, uh, council housing conveners. Um, Mr Johnson asked me uh, earlier on uh, about which local authorities are using the missing share powers and which are not. Um, the civil servants have come up with an answer quite quickly because they probably don't want to give you the letter. Saves them time. There are currently eight local authorities um, with a policy in place and, uh, and, uh, and for missing shares, and seven have used the missing share uh, powers. Those seven are South Ayrshire, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Dundee, Aberdeen, East Lothian, and East Renfrewshire. And Inverclyde has the policy, but has not used the power yet, as far as we are aware. Now, I want to move from that eight to all 32 if they need to use those powers. Uh, and Mr Rowley and Mr Johnson can be assured um, that I will raise that with housing conveners the next time I meet them. Um, in Mr Lyle's speech, um, he mentioned uh, the uh, Common Housing Quality Standard Forum, um, a very important body which uh, has not been mentioned very often today. I, I met, welcome the fact that Mr Lyle has raised them. Uh, we, I'll reiterate our intention uh, to consult on uh, conditions issues, including those identified through the CHQS forum uh, later on um, this year. Um, Mr uh, Simpson, uh, in his opening remarks, concentrated largely on uh, the property factors regime. Um, and I've welcomed the meetings that I've had with Mr Simpson uh, around about constituency issues. Um, and if anyone else has these issues, uh, please feel free to contact me because I do like to keep on top and try and find out how we can resolve these cases. Um, Mr Simpson knows, and I'll reiterate this again as well, uh, that we will consider improvements to strengthen that property factors regulatory regime. Um, and accept, we accept that most factors pr provide a good service, but there are some out there who are not. Um, Mr Simpson also mentioned repeat offender property factors um, at tribunal. I don't want to go into uh, too much depth today about the first tier tri tribunal. It is an independent judicial body uh, and it really wouldn't be uh, appropriate for me to comment on, on such cases or the decisions of the tribunal. There's been talk about housing associations today, uh, particularly uh, by Ms McNeill. Um, I agree with her completely and utterly that housing associations uh, do excellent work uh, in maintaining their properties. Uh, the new powers for local authorities regarding miss and share, as I say, will be extended to them, uh, and I hope that they too uh, will have the ability uh, to use uh, that, uh, those powers. Both Mr Whiteman and Ms McNeill uh, talked of the short-term uh, approach, and I agree uh, that in the review work that is going on in the group and elsewhere, uh, that we must look at long-term sustainable solutions, uh, whether that be through legislation or through other approaches. Uh, and I, I agree completely and utterly with Ms McNeill that during the course of this work, we must think about the costs to owners. Um, because at the end of the day, um, we can come up with some uh, amazing schemes, but if folk don't have the ability um, to invest, then that is not going to happen. Um, and I think that the work that we are doing in terms of our pilot scheme uh, in Glasgow, uh, Perth and Ken Ross and Argyll and Butte uh, will help inform us on how we can maybe help more um, in that regard. Um, Presiding officer, I apologise to those that took part today who I have not mentioned. Um, I will finish off by mentioning uh, Ben McPherson, whose members debate, I think, has moved things on apace um, with the working group and now with this debate here in Parliament. I think it's uh, extremely important for all of us uh, to continue to, to, to talk to one another about these vital issues. And although um, we have concentrated a large amount of today's debate on the buildings themselves, the reality is that this debate is all about people and how we get it right for them, the length and breadth of Scotland. Thank you very much, President Officer. Thank you, Minister. And I call Jamie Green to conclude our debate. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I appreciate we're getting near to five o'clock, but I'll try and get through as much as I can. Uh, possibly to the intrigue of the members who have just joined us, I should say to Mr Stewart, the less we talk about 
demolition dick, the better, I think, this afternoon. Uh, but other than that, it's been a very short but quite a useful debate uh, brought to the Chamber today. I probably should start by declaring an interest. I'm one of those people, uh, despite my ageing years, I'm not yet a homeowner. Somewhere between Generation X, perhaps, and a millennial, uh, there were many people stuck in an endless cycle of paying high rents at a time when the financial world had collapsed and simply weren't lending uh, money. But today's debate isn't just about the difficulties facing a generation of people who rent property. It's about equally improving housing conditions for those who own uh, their properties, especially those living in communal buildings, often with quite mixed ownership. Now, we as MSPs know more than anyone the sheer disparity of housing quality in Scotland. After all, our careers are predicated on knocking on many of those doors, asking for our jobs. Uh, when I was a member of the Equalities and Human Rights Committee, part of our inquiry into human rights in Scotland, uh, Ben McPherson and I visited a housing estate in Leith, not far from this parliament, uh, where it's fair to say that residents were living in quite unacceptable conditions. Dampness, poor wiring, graffiti, uh, drug paraphernalia in the, in the communal areas. And it took a huge amount of advocacy and for residents to come together to lobby the local council to uh, accept that this wasn't just unacceptable conditions. The housing they were in were breaching their basic human rights. Now, to give the council credit, the situation there has improved, uh, and that uh, community is a much safer, cleaner, and vibrant community. But others have much less of a voice in this. How many people do not know what their rights are or what recourse is available to them when things go wrong? Uh, Rick's found that a substantial portion of our housing stock is at risk from a lack of maintenance, that they described it as a condition cliff edge. They concluded that the government simply has to address the maintenance agenda, or that future generations will not thank us for passing on this problem. I don't disagree. If 44% of homes in Scotland are failing to meet the Scottish housing quality standard, then why have 17 councils not issued a single work notice to require owners to carry out remedial work in the past five years. Why is that? Why are they so reluctant to use the powers that the 2006 Act gave them? Much has been said today also around the issue of factors. Uh, we want to see uh, a system of compulsory factoring in new build flats that increased uh, regulations in the sector, but also improves the culture of property management in Scotland. Now, like many MSBs, uh, we deal with a tremendous amount of casework related to problematic factors. Now, I won't name names, but there is a problem and there is a pattern of bad behaviour. Factoring contracts being sold from one company to another. Factoring, uh, factoring companies fabricating competitive quotations and giving work to preferred suppliers in often dubious circumstances. Factors who are uh, reluctant to collect revenues from every tenant in a block uh, for uh, up upgrades or, or restorative repairs. And in some cases, tenants are really getting very little for their money, deteriorating standards in communal areas and gardens and facades, aging and in need of upgrade, despite promises to do so. If I have time. Briefly, Mr Johnson. I just, thank you very much for giving uh, uh, way. Um, I was just wondering if the member would uh, agree with us that, that cooperative structures and, and owners' associations could act as an alternative to factoring. And would members keep the general conversation down? Mr Green. Uh, Mr Johnson makes a good point. Uh, factoring, uh, uh, whilst it should, uh, we think it should be compulsory on new build flats to uh, get those practices in place from the very beginning, uh, in some circumstances where neighbours and communities can work together to form communal um, groups, then that may be the right way forward. I, I, I absolutely agree with his, his comments. Uh, but Graham Simpson gave an excellent example of what happens when it doesn't go well. He gave the example of uh, one of his constituents who took matters into their own hands at their own expense because they really had no choice otherwise. But I don't think they should have to. The fees are taken month after month and the response from factors is often aggressive, nonchalant and quite unhelpful. And that's not anecdotal. I've written to factors and that's the tone they've taken with us as MSPs, not least with their own uh, constituents. But this isn't an anti-factor debate. There is good practice out there. It's not a rogue trade, but it is a trade with rogues in it. And we need to do more for our constituents. Uh, we're also calling for a more robust system of complaint and tribunal process that has real powers of compliance. And ultimately, there needs to be a process for the removal of factors who consistently fail in their duties and who are repeat offenders. If the sheer volume of casework 
that we get on this matter isn't proof enough of the need for change, then goodness knows what we need to intervene. So, presiding officer, in summing up, here's what these benches are asking of the government today. Mandatory health checks on buildings, compulsory factoring uh, schemes on new build flats, beefing up the complaint system for factors and a general review of the status quo, increased regulation of factors and a transparent register of factors with ratings that flags poor performance and poor practice. And what more can government do to ensure that councils are able to and even willing to use the powers already at their disposal? And yes, we should take a frank look at current housing legislation. Is it fit for purpose? I wouldn't label any of these asked today as particularly partisan, so I do hope that the uh, Minister and the Government reflects on today's debates, or as Rick's warned us, future generations will give us little thanks for passing on this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, and that concludes our debate on housing. The next debate is, so the next item of business is consideration of business motions 12387 and 12388, which set out a business programme and the timetable for a bill at stage one. If anyone wishes to speak against these motions, please say so now, and I call on uh, Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau to move the motions on block. Moved on block. Thank you. No one objects, therefore the question is, I propose to put a single question on these two motions. Does anyone object to that? No. Uh, therefore, the question is that motions 12387 and 12388, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next item of business is consideration of Parliamentary Bureau Motion 12389 on co Code of Conduct for Councillors. Could I call on Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau to move the motion? Formally moved. Thank you. <coughs> we turn now to decision time. The first question is that Amendment 12358.4 in the name of John Swinney, which seeks to amend Motion 12358 in the name of Liz Smith on education subject choices, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The next question is that Amendment 12358.1 in the name of Ian Gray, which seeks to amend the motion in the name of Liz Smith on education, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And the next question is that motion 12358 in the name of Liz Smith as amended on education subject choices be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Now I remind members that if the amendment in the name of Kevin Stewart is agreed then the amendment in the name of Pauline McNeill will fall. So the next question is that amendment 12342.3 in the name of Kevin Stewart which seeks to amend motion 12342 in the name of Graeme Simpson on housing be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 12342.3 in the name of Kevin Stewart is yes, 101, no, 21. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The amendment in the name of Polly McNeill is preempted. And th therefore, the next question is that motion 12342 in the name of Graham Simpson as amended on housing be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. The final question is that motion 12389 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Bureau on Code of Conduct for Councillors be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. That concludes decision time. We'll now move to members' business in the name of Bruce Crawford on 10 years of Systema Scotland and the Big Noise Orchestra, but we'll take a few moments for members to, and ministers to change seats. <laughs> 